welcome. I'm Frank Lavallo, and this is Novel Conversations. Today, I'm having a conversation about the novel Atlas Shrugged by Ayn Rand. And I'm joined in my conversation by our Novel Conversations readers, Joan and Patrick Andrews. Joan, Patrick, hello. Hello, Frank. Glad to be here. Hello, Frank. Glad to have you both. Joan, Patrick, before we get started, let me read a brief introduction to today's novel, Atlas Shrugged. (laughs) Good luck. Written by Ayn Rand and published in 1957, Atlas Shrugged is the story of a labor strike, a strike so strong and united that it destroys the country's major industries and cripples the world's economies. But this strike is not a strike by industrial workers. After years of government interference, spiraling taxation, and increasing public hatred, the owners of the country's industries shrug their shoulders, close their companies, and disappear. But Dagny Taggart of Taggart Transcontinental Railroad will not shrug and will not disappear. How Dagny shoulders the increasingly difficult burden of running a business in an anti-business climate and how she discovers who John Galt is make up the bulk of our novel, Atlas Shrugged. Now, Joan, with that introduction, let me ask you, is this the first time you've read Atlas Shrugged? No, it's not. It's my second time reading this almost 1,100-page novel, and I wish there were 1,100 pages more. Well, I guess there have been 1,100 pages more for me, Frank, because this is actually my third time (laughs) through Atlas Shrugged. Wow, and I thought I was good just getting through 1,100 pages once. (laughs) What captivated you both so much with this novel? Well, for me, it's the incredible characters that she creates, her leading character in this novel being Dagny Taggart. I was just enthralled by this character, this fully, proudly amoral character whom I want so much to be like, but I don't really want to be like. (laughs) Joan, I totally agree with you about the character Dagny and a lot of the other characters in this novel. I read this first for its philosophy, but what will bring me back are indeed the characters. Patrick, how about you? Well, Frank, I think Atlas Shrugged, for me, really embodies your definition of what a classic is. Each time I read this book, for the first time maybe 25 years ago, and then when I read it maybe 10 years ago, and then again just this past year, each time it seemed like whatever was going on in the world was being addressed so presently and accurately by Rand in the book. Absolutely. You'd read something else and think, now, wait a minute, that was in the paper yesterday. Right. More than one time, I would flip back to the front cover of the book and say, wait, when was this written? That's amazing. This was published in 1957. I'm proud to say it's just as old as I am. (laughs) And yet, as Patrick said, timeless and its relevancy to today's events is a little scary for what our future might bring. Mm -hmm. Well, fortunately for us, Hundreds of thousands of people have been reading this book anew every year since 1957. So perhaps we're not fated to the same future as Dagny. Patrick, you're right. While the book does contain some dire warnings for us, it also has the blueprint for our success. And we need to figure out who is John Galt. All right, Joan Patrick, there was a strike going on in the country. But when we first meet our main character, Dagny Taggart, she's vaguely aware of some problems in the country with some of the companies her rail line does business with. But it's only when problems occur on her own railroad that she realizes just how bad the situation has become. Right. One of the first things she notices is that some of her regular suppliers are just unable to fulfill her orders for things like steel rail, boxcars and brakes and all the sorts of things that a railroad needs. She's also beginning to realize that people like her hapless brother, James Taggart, are beginning to get the upper hand in business and government. Her brother, James, has said to her, selfish greed for profit is a thing of the past. But the problem is that's not going to get you your steel so you can lay your track and keep your railroad running. But she's not just having trouble finding steel and finding equipment and finding workers. Some of the men that she's had these contracts with for years are actually disappearing. Their companies are going away. Yeah, and oddly, some of these businesses, they were seemingly prosperous outfits. Then it starts happening inside of her own company. One of her best employees just quits on her. And when she tries to pay him more, to convince him in some way to stay, he just looks at her and shrugs and says, who is John Galt? Who is John Galt? Nobody knows. It's just sort of a slang term that people have adopted that means something along the lines of, well, who knows, what does it matter, who cares? But it gets under Dagny's skin because if there's a question out there, she wants to know the answer. But Joan, before Dagny can go look trying to solve that riddle, she needs to get some steel. So she turns to an old friend, Hank Reardon, 
Right. Hank Reardon is an industrialist who has actually created his own metal. They've called it Reardon Metal. And of course, all the other big industrialists and government regulators have laughed at him and worse, have done all that they can to keep such metal from the market because, frankly, they know that if it's as good as he says it's going to be, it'll put them out of business. So they're not interested in that kind of progress. But Patrick, while Dagny's looking to protect her rail line company, By finding new sources of steel, her brother Jim is in Washington trying to protect the company a different way, a more, shall we say, political way. That's right. Jim doesn't really run the railroad. Dagny does. He spends his time talking with his friends, the regulators in Washington, trying to not find better ways to run the railroad, but ways to sort of change the rules. They would probably call themselves the corporate titans. Right. So their latest scheme is the aptly named anti-dog-eat-dog rule. (laughs) As business is getting tougher for the railroads, they decide they would like to eliminate competition. (laughs) Some dog might eat the other. And somebody might win big. That's right. And they don't want any of that. So what they propose to do is sort of carve up the country into regions and each railroad that happens to have a seat at the little table that they're at gets their part of the country. No one will compete with them. So they'll be safe, their own little monopoly. But Patrick, while Jim Taggart's in Washington building monopolies, Dagny is back on the line building a railroad. That's right. She's formed sort of a partnership with Hank Reardon and Ellis Wyatt, a Colorado oil man, to lay this new track out in Colorado that's going to include the railroad track as well as a huge new bridge completely constructed out of this Reardon metal. Which, of course, the media have hyped as a disaster in the making. But let's be clear, the media is being led by the other steelmakers. Yeah, in fact, even the railroaders' union is refusing to allow any of their engineers or railroad men to ride the train. And of course, the prestigious State Science Institute has banned children from riding on trains with Reardon metal. So, of course, Dagny, Ellis, and Hank have promised to make the maiden voyage in the engine across this new bridge. Well? Oh, it's a very dramatic ride. But yes, they make it. And it pretty much changes... Dagny and Hank's relationship. That's right, Joan. We can say that Dagny and Hank's relationship becomes more passionate. Yep. Tell me about how the other steelmakers respond to the success of Reardon Metal. Well, they're certainly not going to make a better, cheaper, lighter steel. They turn to what they do best, which is work for the passage of some new legislation like the Preservation of Livelihood Law, which says Reardon must limit his production of his successful metal so as not to damage the livelihood of all the other (laughs) steelmakers. And the Fair Share Law, which says that Reardon has to sell an equal amount of all of his Reardon metal to all of his customers. Everyone gets a fair share of it. That's right. It wouldn't be fair for the Taggarts to be getting all of the Reardon metal. Or somebody who wanted to pay more to get more. Well, Joan, let's get back to Hank's passion for Dagny. (laughs) Well, before the Washington cabal is successful in this new legislation, Hank and Dagny have gone off on a little secret vacation together. They were actually taking a road trip through the upper Midwest, and they find the remnants of a motor that Dagny can tell would have been a self-generating motor. It would have been the cleanest, swiftest, cheapest means of motion ever devised. Hank and she knew immediately that this would have changed the world. And this starts Dagny on a quest to find out who created this motor and what happened. Joan, that's right. But as will happen often, Dagny's quest is interrupted by the demands of running Taggart Railroad. Right. And it just keeps getting worse for her as more people keep disappearing, like Alice Wyatt, her oil man. But he didn't just disappear. He set fire to all his wells and then disappeared. That's right, which leads Dagny to conclude that there is some, as she terms it, destroyer loose in the country. She does, and yet not all the industrialists who are destroying are disappearing. Her dear childhood friend, who has long been estranged from her, Francisco D'Anconio of the D'Anconio Mine Company, the largest copper mine company in the world, has for the last few years seemed to be bent on destroying everything that his family has built up over generations. And she hates him for it. And Hank Reardon hates him too. That is until he has a meeting with Francisco and a very interesting conversation that turns some of that hate to confusion. Francisco, referring to the increasing regulatory burden that Reardon is under, asks him, when you strain your energy to its utmost to produce the best, do you expect to be rewarded or punished? Then, if you were punished instead, 
What sort of code have you accepted? That's right. And Francisco continues, wherever there is a man who needs or uses metal in any way, Reardon Metal has made his life easier for him. Has it made yours easier for you? No, Reardon said. And then later on, Francisco goes on to say to Reardon, you take pride in setting no limit to your endurance, Mr. Reardon, because you think that you are doing right. What if you aren't? What if you're placing your virtue in the service of evil and letting it become a tool for the destruction of everything you love, respect, and admire? And then Francisco sort of wraps up the entire conversation with one more question for Hank Reardon. Just one little question. (sighs) Mr. Reardon, if you saw Atlas, the giant who holds the world on his shoulders, if you saw that he stood, blood running down his chest, his knees buckling, his arms trembling but still trying to hold the world aloft with the last of his strength, And the greater his effort, the heavier the world bore down on his shoulders. What would you tell him to do? I don't know. What could he do? What would you tell him? To shrug. And before Reardon can react to that one, a fire breaks out in the mills, and Francisco the playboy and Reardon the virtuous one go and fight side by side to save the mills. But Joan, after this fire at the mills, things get even worse for Hank Reardon. He now has to go on trial for violating one of the new economic laws. Right, and I think particularly thanks to Francisco's visit, he realizes that if you're going to run a business, you have to violate one of these silly laws. The whole trial is a sham and they know it. So in the trial, he just stands up and says, if they, meaning the state, believe that they may seize my property simply because they need it, well, so does any burglar. There's only one difference. The burglar does not ask me to sanction his act. And he pretty much shuts down the trial by declaring it invalid. That's right. And Hank Reardon essentially goes back to trying to run his business. He even becomes a customer of Francisco D'Anconia. But that ends up backfiring on Reardon. How's that? Well, immediately after Reardon's trial, Francisco comes to visit him again, where he learns that Hank has just purchased a large amount of copper from one of D'Anconia's mines. And Francisco is alarmed at this. He shouts at Reardon, I told you not to make any deals with D'Anconia copper. Reardon's stupefied. And he turns to Reardon and says, Mr. Reardon, for the time when you're going to doubt every word I said, I swear to you by the woman I love that I am your friend. And those words ring in Reardon's ears three days later. When word comes to Reardon that all three ships carrying his copper have been sunk by the pirate Ragnar Damskold. Reardon's back to hating Francisco again. And Joan, with good reason, the failure to get this shipment of copper in leads to the first failure in the Reardon Company history, which then leads to him not being able to supply line to the Taggart Railroad. Their line starts to disintegrate. Now Ken Daniger cannot move his coal, so companies that rely on his coal are now going out of business. Mm -hmm. There's a ball-bearing company in Chicago, can't get coal for their furnaces, they go out of business. The tractor factory couldn't get the ball bearings from the company in Chicago, they go out of business. But don't worry. The boys in Washington are at work again. They're going to fix it. Well, what is the government solution this time? Well, the D.C. group gets together and they pass another law that makes it illegal for people to quit or for businesses to close. That should work. And they have decided that corporate property is really public property. So nobody can own a patent. And anyone who does must sign the National Gift Certificate, giving their patent to the government. I'm guessing this is their way of going after Hank Reardon again. Yes, it is. But they know that Hank won't be had by their kind of logic. So they use a different kind of logic. They know about the affair between Hank and Dagny. And they tell him if he doesn't sign the National Gift Certificate for the Reardon Medal patent, they will expose Dagny for what she is, a homewrecker. Well, Patrick, does the blackmail work? Well, yes, it does. He does sign over his rights to Reardon Medal. And Joan, the fact that Hank Reardon signed this certificate of gift drives Dagny to resign her position with Taggart Railroad, and she goes up to a family house in the mountains. Dagny's having a meeting of her own with Francisco. And it's an incredibly revealing conversation. He says, I am destroying Danconia Copper consciously, deliberately, by plan, and by my own hand. I have to plan it as carefully and work as hard as if I were producing a fortune in order not to let them notice it and stop me, in order not to let them seize the mine until it is too late. And them, according to Francisco, is the state. He calls them the looters. 
And he essentially uses the same line of argument on Dagny that he did on Hank, explaining it is not he, Francisco, and the destroyers who are surrendering their property to the looters. It is her. She is working harder and harder just to let them survive. He wants her to join him and the others like him who are withdrawing their talents from the world until the world acknowledges that they need them. And he almost convinces her. Almost. But before she can take that final step, she hears some tragic news on the radio. As a result of incompetence and ineptitude, the comet, Taggart's premier transcontinental train, has exploded inside the famous Taggart Tunnel in Colorado. Oh, it's so sad. Demolishing the tunnel and all the passengers on the train, described as the greatest disaster in railroad history. And with that, Dagny doesn't see or hear Francisco anymore. She runs to her car and she is back in the game. And Dagny, like nobody else in the country anymore, manages to fix things as best as possibly can be fixed. But Joan, Francisco's not giving up. He comes back one more time to try to convince her to leave this looter's world. At the same time that Hank Reardon comes to visit Dagny. So there's an awkward meeting in Dagny's apartment where everyone realizes where they stand in relationship to Dagny. And with the knowledge that Reardon and Dagny are having an affair, Francisco just leaves. It's not easy for him, but he leaves. But Patrick, the very next day, Dagny gets a letter that delivers another blow to her. That's right. Quentin Daniels, the bright young scientist that Dagny had hired to try and figure out the secret of this motor she and Hank had discovered in the ruins of the 20th Century Motor Company, sent a letter saying he'll no longer accept payment for work on trying to figure out the secret of this motor. Right. He's going to continue working on finding that secret, but he doesn't want to take money for it, nor will he release any of his results to the general public. Dagny immediately realizes that the destroyer must have gotten to Daniels. And Joan, she immediately jumps on a train west to try to head Quentin Daniels off. And amazingly, she meets on this train a guy who's a hobo now, but someone who used to work for that 20th Century Motor Company. That's right. She gets the backstory on what had been this great company and its demise under the management of the original owner's heirs. Yes, the children of the heirs embraced an entirely new management philosophy. That's right. In fact, their slogan was, from each according to his ability, to each according to his need. Right. And this hobo who used to be a worker says, it took us just one meeting to discover that we had become beggars because no man could claim his pay as his rightful earning. His work didn't belong to him. It belonged to the family. This system kills ambition, incentive, the profit motive. If you're going to be given your housing and you're going to be given your food, no matter what you contribute, why contribute? They voted which men were the best. And these men were sentenced to work overtime each night for the next six months. <laughs> and as we can imagine, those with great ability left this company. Thus the hulking wreck in the middle of the Minnesota plains. But Joan, while Dagny found this discussion of economics interesting, she wanted to know about that motor. Mm -hmm. Who built that motor? Where was the engineer of that motor? Oh yeah, the hobo does remember that it was a young, promising engineer who was also one of the first to realize the economic disaster this new management philosophy was leading them towards. He stood up at one of the meetings and said, I will put an end to this once and for all. I will stop the motor of the world. And nobody had seen him since. But over time, as the workers saw the lights start going out at factory after factory, they began to wonder about that engineer and his promise to stop the motor of the world. That's when they began to formulate the question, who is John Galt? They asked that question because, of course, the young engineer's name was John Galt. Dagny is shocked. After all this time, she's finally on the trail of John Galt. But of course, Dagny realizes that her closest real connection to John Galt is still Quentin Daniels, who's been working on the remnants of his motor. So she's even more desperate to get to Utah to find Daniels. And her desperation increases when the train suddenly stops, and she realizes all the workers have deserted and run off into the desert. But no fear, the ever-resourceful Dagny tracks him down to an airfield in Utah minutes after he has just recently left with a man flying a beautiful plane. And Dagny knows that's probably the destroyer who's got Daniels, and she has got to chase him down. Literally, she jumps into a plane, pilots it herself, and flies after them. Right, and Dagny follows this plane into the Rocky Mountains, where she finally loses it and then ends up crash-landing her own plane into what turns out to be a hidden valley here in the Rockies. 
And Patrick, while her injuries aren't very severe, she does lose consciousness for a while, and upon awakening, is face to face with a stranger. Or is he? John Galt. And it all starting to come together for Dagny now. What's coming together? Well, Dagny realizes now that John Galt is who she was searching as the motor's inventor and the destroyer who's stealing all the great industrialists from the world. Women's Running Stories, where we explore the intersection between running and life. Because every woman who is committed to a running journey has a story to tell, and this is where you'll find those stories. I am host and producer Cherie Louise Turner. I'm a 53-year-old runner, and together with original music by musician and runner Cormac O'Regan, we bring these inspirational stories to life. Please join us to fuel your adventures. But Patrick, once Dagny realizes who else is in this valley, she quickly understands John Galt is not a destroyer. All the great business leaders who have disappeared over the course of the book have found a home in this valley in the Rockies. And of course, not just industrialists, but leaders in all their fields. Bankers, engineers, philosophers, teachers, composers. And, although at this point she's not surprised, Francisco D'Anconia. Of course. But Joan, Dagny discovers that not only is John Galt here, his motor's here as well. And it works. Everything works in the valley. It's a utopia. Amongst themselves, they call it Atlantis. <laughs> That's right. And Dagny realizes here an honest day's work gives you an honest day's pay. And because she is injured and only a visitor to this place, she accepts her only role there as a cook and a maid to John Galt. That's right. They really live by one rule and one rule alone. I will never live for the sake of another man, nor ask another man to live for mine. And in fact, that is the oath you have to take to remain in the valley. That's right. Self-reliant capitalism rules in this valley. But she learns that not everyone who has taken that oath actually stays in the valley. Well, of course, we know Francisco comes and goes from this valley. We've seen him in, let's say, the other world. We know Ragnar Daniskold. The pirate. The pirate is not only in this valley, but again, we've seen him in the other world. Right. We even learn that John Galt spends most of his time outside the valley, but we don't learn where or what he's doing. But on top of this, she learns that whether they're in the valley or they're out, they are all on strike. When we say they go back to the other world to work, what their work is, is recruiting other industrialists, other bankers, other great minds to go on strike and join them in the valley. Right. And Patrick, there will come a time when, when Dagny has to decide what will her work be. Once she's recovered from her injuries, she's going to have to decide for herself whether she can take the striker's oath and remain in the valley. And the decision is even more complicated for her now because she realizes that John Galt is the man for her. But even with that realization, Dagny eventually does decide she's going to leave the valley. But she goes back now knowing that the valley is there for her whenever she's ready to take that oath. And if we thought things were a mess before she left, they're really a mess now. And one of the biggest problems facing the railroad is the new railroad unification plan. This is the work of her brother and his cronies in Washington. Who we now refer to as the looters. That's right. <laughs> this new plan calls for all the railroads to pool all their profits together. And then out of that pool, the railroads will be paid according to their need <laughs> rather than to whatever they've produced or work they've done. <laughs> Here we go again. And ironically, the looters know they need Dagny to be the one to promote this to the general public. She's the only one that could conceivably have the nation's respect at this point. So the looters think they can convince Dagny to go on the radio and tell the public about the wonderful railroad unification plan. But Patrick, they don't mean convince her. They actually mean blackmail her. They know about her affair with Hank Reardon. That's right, but Dagny's a little better at their game than they are. And she agrees to go on the radio. And what does she have to say about that railroad unification plan? Nothing. <laughs> what does she say? Dagny tells how the government blackmailed Hank Reardon into turning over his Reardon medal to the government. She does do a nice job of turning the tables on these looters. She does, but in so doing, she also breaks Hank Reardon's heart. Breaks his heart how? Well, when she sees Hank after, he tells her that he knows while she was gone, she must have met the man she truly loves because she spoke of the affair in the past tense. But Patrick, this is actually good for Hank Reardon. That's right, because this blackmail was the only thing that the looters could hold over Reardon's head. But the looters do have other schemes. Hmm. They've conspired to nationalize Danconia Copper in Argentina. How are they going to make that work? 
Well, they've cut a deal with Argentinian politicians. What they're going to do is sell their stock in Danconia Copper. Then the next day, Argentina will nationalize the mines. So, of course, their stock is worthless. And then Jim Taggart and his cronies will then invest in the new nationalized Danconia Copper, and they'll make a fortune. They'd be the only providers of copper in the whole world. Yeah, I can see how you'd make a fortune doing that. But Francisco D'Anconio will not be outwitted by these looters. Patrick, it's not even close. The day before it's set to happen, all of his copper mines blow up, his bank holdings disappear, and Danconia copper is left a smoldering ruin. And now Taggart and his friends own 100% of nothing. They're almost completely wiped out. And this starts the unraveling of the economy, something all the disappeared industrialists were waiting for. That's right. There is now no copper in the world. If a train stops running, no copper to repair it. If a motor stops running, no copper to fix it. Literally, the motor of the world is slowing down and can't be fixed if it breaks. And so chaos and riots are breaking out all over the country. There's a gun battle in Hank Reardon's own steel mill. Right, and actually, once again, Hank Reardon's life is saved by Francisco D'Anconia, who we discover has been working for Hank for a couple months. Ever since he blew up his own mind. That's right. But this time, Francisco succeeds in his mission, and he and Hank disappear. Right, and with winter coming, the country is looking at the possibility of famine and starvation. And of course, during all this, Dagny is doing the best she can to keep Transcontinental alive. She even teaches her workers how to use flags for signaling trains instead of the lights, how to flip the switch manually for the tracks instead of using electricity. Really going old school. Right, and during one of these meetings with her workers, she sees the face of John Galt among her employees, and she realizes he works for her. And that's when the looters announced that tomorrow night, the president of the United States will come on the radio and give an address to the nation in an attempt to calm their fears. But it's not going to happen. What does happen? John Galt preempts all national broadcasts with a speech of his own. Well, what does John Galt have to say to the nation? Plenty. John Galt reveals who he is and that he and all the other industrialists and businessmen who have disappeared are actually on strike. That's right. He tells them, We are useless according to your economics. We've chosen not to exploit you any longer. We are dangerous and to be shackled according to your politics. We have chosen not to endanger you, nor wear the shackles any longer. Right, and he goes on to tell them, You seek escape from pain. We seek the achievement of happiness. You exist for the sake of avoiding punishment. We exist for the sake of earning rewards. And for the next three hours, he goes on to expound on his philosophy. And in the end, he doesn't sugarcoat it. He tells them there's only one way that we're coming back. That's right. He says, when the looter's state collapses, deprived of the best of its slaves, when it falls to a level of impotent chaos and dissolves into starving robber gangs fighting to rob one another, then we will return. This isn't the speech the president was going to make. That's for sure. But the speech was effective. The people have a hero, and the looters have a target. And the looters realize they can either co-opt John Galt or kill him. All right, Joan, how does Plan A, co-opt John Galt, work? Well, they developed the John Galt Plan. It will reconcile all conflicts. It will cut down the burden of your taxes and provide you with more government benefits. It will lower prices and raise wages. It will combine the efficiency of free enterprise with the generosity of a planned economy. Does sound like a good plan. Does John Galt get co-opted? Well, they tell him that he will be present when they announce this plan on national television, where at the same time, he will say that he is agreeing to become the economic dictator of the country. How does this TV appearance go? Well, when the camera turns to Galt, he moves quickly in such a way that the entire national audience sees the gun that's been pointed at his ribs the whole time he's been sitting there. Well, Joan, I'm guessing now they have to go to plan B, kill John Galt? Well, Frank, of course they don't want to kill John Galt, but perhaps they could torture him into accepting the economic dictatorship of the country. Sort of a plan 1A. (laughs) Yes. Well, Patrick, do they torture John Galt? Well, they do. They hook him up at the State Science Institute with some sort of electrical torture device. But of course, it breaks down. (laughs) Is there an engineer in the house? (laughs) Of course, there's no one around to fix it except John 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 Goff. (laughs) Well, are they successful in their plan B with the repaired torture device? No, they're not. Hank Reardon, Dagny Tagner, Ragnar, Dennis Gold, and Francisco D'Anconio come to his rescue. Just in time. Just in time. 
and essentially it's the rescue of John Galt and their departure for Atlanta's Valley that ends our novel, Atlas Shrugged, by Ayn Rand. On a slightly hopeful note. I think on a more than slightly hopeful note. Now, of course, in an hour's conversation, we couldn't introduce every character or get to every scene in the novel. So if there's a character you want to tell us about or maybe a quote you want to read, now's your opportunity. Patrick, do you have something? Yeah, I think Rand does a great job of using some of the minor characters to illustrate some of the larger philosophical points. She uses her minor and major characters to make those points. Right. And so here's a scene where Dagny is on the trail of the inventor of the motor. She comes across this bank president who at one point had financed the 20th century motor company. And he ran his bank into the ground and she's asking him about some of the loans that he extended. And he says, no moral guilt can be attached to me inasmuch as I lost everything I possessed in the crash of that bank. It seems to me that I should have the right to feel proud of such a sacrifice. And Dagny sort of lets that go and then asks about the men that he loaned the money to. And he says, they were perfectly good men. They were a perfectly sound risk, though, of course, I'm speaking in human terms, not in the terms of cold cash, which you are accustomed to expect from bankers. I granted them the loan for the purchase of that factory because they needed the money. If people needed money, that was enough for me. The heart was my collateral. Yeah. Anybody want to place any money in that bank? I'm not investing there. And actually, I'm glad you read that because what I'd like to read is Hank Reardon, one of the major characters, giving us the opposite view, giving us Ayn Rand's view of profit. I work for nothing but my own profit, which I make by selling a product they need to men who are willing and able to buy it. I do not produce it for their benefit at the expense of mine, and they do not buy it for my benefit at the expense of theirs. Do I wish to pay my workers more than their services are worth to me? I do not. Do I wish to sell my product for less than my customers are willing to pay me? I do not. And he does not. No, he doesn't. Joan, do you have something? Oh, gosh, yes. Just one, though. (laughs) So, as you said, there's so many, many characters, some never named beyond, say, the rich woman with the diamond earrings or something like that. There's a quote between Francisco and some silly woman at a high society cocktail party. Francisco had actually been explaining his philosophy about work to the crowd. And this woman finally just turns to him and says, oh, I can't answer you. I don't have any answers. My mind doesn't work that way. But I don't feel that you're right. So I know that you're wrong. Feeling instead of thinking. Yes. And this is the world that John Galt and Dagny and Hank and Francisco were up again. Well, speaking of great cocktail party conversation, I do have another one involving some minor characters. I think maybe at the same cocktail party. It involves a character named Balf Eubank, a writer. He has been discussing the Equalization of Opportunity Bill, and he's discussing applying this bill to the arts and to writers. He says, there should be a law limiting the sale of any book to 10,000 copies. This would throw the literary market open to new talent, fresh ideas, and non-commercial writing. If people were forbidden to buy a million copies of the same piece of trash, they would be forced to buy better books. And someone responds, wouldn't it be kind of tough on the writer's bank accounts? So much the better. Only those whose motive is not money-making should be allowed to write. Another person responds, what if more than 10,000 people want to buy a certain book? 10,000 readers is enough for any book. So I guess by that account, Ayn Rand sold 27,355,000 too many books. But who's counting? Apparently this guy was. (laughs) (laughs) I'd like to go back to one of the major characters, Ragnar Damaskold, the pirate that was stealing the gold and giving it back to the capitalists. And this is his version of the Robin Hood myth. Robin Hood was the man who robbed the rich and gave to the poor. Well, I'm the man who robs the poor and gives to the rich. Or to be exact... The man who robs the thieving poor and gives back to the productive rich. Yes, he's righting the wrongs of the looter. He is, and that's what he tells Hank Reardon. That's why he's fighting. Right, and that's typical of how Rand turns conventional wisdom on its head throughout the book. She almost uses absurdity to expose the absurd. Oh, she does. And that's where we'll end today's conversation about the novel Atlas Shrugged by Ayn Rand. Joan, Patrick, I want to thank you both for coming in and having this conversation with me today. You're welcome, Frank. Joining me now for endnotes on today's conversation is our researcher, Ted Schwartz. Hello, Ted. Hi, Frank. Ted, is it true that Ayn Rand wrote this 1,100-page novel because no one understood her first 1,100-page novel, The Fountainhead? Well, here's what she said about that in an interview in 1957 with the New York Times. I was disappointed in the reaction to The Fountainhead. A good many of the reviewers missed the point. A friend called me to sympathize and said I should write a nonfiction book about the ideas back of the Fountainhead. 
While I was talking, I thought, I simply don't want to do this. What if I went on strike? My husband, Frank O'Connor, and I talked about that all night, and the idea was born then. But let me ask you, was this second attempt to explain her philosophy better received? The reviews weren't very good, but the book sold extremely well, as they've continued to do ever since. She also, though she's never been considered a great novelist, her philosophy has been taken quite seriously, and that seems to be one of the things that drives the interest. In fact, she was considered so serious a philosopher that she scored one of the major coups of her career and actually got a Playboy interview. Yes, and while it's something that a lot of us joke about now, at the time she did this in the 1950s, this was a very serious publication in terms of the editorial. Tell me what she said in the interview. When I came here from Soviet Russia, I was interested in politics for only one reason, to reach the day when I would not have to be interested in politics. I wanted to secure a society in which I would be free to pursue my own concerns and goals, knowing that the government would not interfere to wreck them, knowing that my life, my work, my future were not at the mercy of the state or of a dictator's whim. Well, Ted, her quote there sounds somewhat hopeful, but in Atlas Shrugged, the changes had already occurred. We were in the midst of, if not a full dictatorship, pretty darn close. When she compared the era in which she was writing with what she was writing, she said, What we have today is not a capitalist society, but a mixed economy. That is, a mixture of freedom and controls, which, by the presently dominant trend, is moving toward dictatorship. The action in Atlas Shrug takes place at a time when society has reached the stage of dictatorship. When and if this happens, that will be the time to go on strike, but not until then. And Ted, in that article, she gives us a very clear definition of what she believes a dictatorship will look like. She said, A dictatorship has four characteristics. One-party rule, executions without trial for political offenses, expropriation or nationalization of private property, and censorship. Above all, this last. So long as men can speak and write freely, so long as there is no censorship, they still have a chance to reform their society or to put it on a better road. When censorship is imposed, that is a sign that men should go on strike intellectually, by which I mean should not cooperate with the social system in any way, whatever. Well, all I can say is I'm glad that when Ayn Rand thought about going on strike, she didn't. <laughs> Ted, as always, thanks for all the great information you brought us today. <laughs> You're welcome, Frank. I also want to thank our Novel Conversations readers, Joan and Patrick Andrews. You've been listening to Novel Conversations. I'm your host, Frank Lavallo. Today I had a conversation about the novel Atlas Shrugged by Ayn Rand. Until next time, I hope you find yourself in a novel conversation. Novel Conversations is a production of the Front Porch People. Listen to more great conversations at thefrontporchpeople.com. Thank you for listening. Coming up on 5-Minute News, I'm Anthony Davis. You might think it's partisan because maybe it's critical of one side or the other, but it's not. It's just the truth. And I think that's also something that's kind of unusual for Americans listening to the radio or to podcasts because the news landscape in the States has been so partisan for so many decades. So 5-Minute News is verified, truthful, independent, unbiased and essential world news daily. This podcast was produced with the support of the Ohio Motion Picture Tax Credit and in partnership with the Ohio Development Services Agency.